Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is the most lucrative TV show in the history of the world. They make well over a billion dollars a year in just the U.S., and it's on in 40 or so different countries. You'd think they'd have enough money to know what they're doing. All the Regises and on all the planets orbiting all the stars in this universe and a trillion others couldn't ask enough questions over the lifetime of the universe for that phrasing to have occurred at random. I have a tattoo on my ankle that says born to do math and that serves to remind me of what I should be doing when I'm naked in front of an art class if I happen to see it reminds me that I shouldn't be just being a, a nude boy or being a bouncer I should be doing physics and math There were some early indications. Just all these little anecdotal things. Putting together the puzzle of the 50 states at some early age. Sitting in the barber chair, reading Esquire magazine at age four and asking what premature ejaculation means. People were bigger on the whole concept of genius back then. Post Sputnik, U.S. catching up space race. Parents thinking that their kids were geniuses. And I had all that genius stuff. When I was in junior high, I built a three-dimensional statistical distribution curve generator that made a three-dimensional bell curve out of BBs for no good reason. No good reason. Made a nice curve though. Every nerdy person hopes or knows in his heart that he's nerdy but that he's so brilliant that his inner goodness and smartness will shine through and and he'll still be able to get a girlfriend. There was one of these basement kind of kissing parties. I'm hitting on this girl. I'm trying to get her to kiss me by asking her, you know, exactly how do you kiss? And so I said, well, how do you kiss? Suction or pressure? And somebody heard me say suction or pressure. And that went up on all the blackboards for the rest of eighth grade, suction or pressure. My dog was really embarrassing, Mitzi the Poodle. My best friend had Floyd the Beagle. We would walk our dogs together thinking that somehow it would be less embarrassing if we each walked our embarrassing dog together. We had long walks, we'd walk for miles just trying to figure out how we would ever, ever lose our virginity. At the end of the 70s, we're talking disco, we're talking mostly pre-herpes, pre-HIV. It was important to get laid. And when I say get laid, it's kind of shorthand for the whole having a girlfriend thing. You know, I would have been happy to have a girlfriend and if she, you know, touched my wiener every once in a while, or at least, you know, French kissed me and let me, you know, play with her boobs or something, you know, but, you know, none of that was happening. It wasn't exactly a nervous breakdown, but it wasn't 
stable behavior either. I took advantage of whatever laws let me get access to my high school permanent record. I found out my actual IQ scores. They were about 150. I wanted to do the most interesting thing, which is think about the structure of the world, you know, like an Einstein would do. I didn't think IQ 150 was adequate for doing that. So you just saw the score of 150 and just decided that wasn't good enough? That's not world-shakingly smart. That's the smartest person at your high school smart. And that's what scared me about Harvard, because I'd be going to school with a bunch of people who all had IQs of 150. So I decided to re-educate myself as a not-so-smart person. I took as my model of behavior and appearance Barbarino from Welcome Back Cotter. So I started lifting weights, started talking like this, and you know, tried to get my hair all poofy and Travolta-like and just walking. But this is Boulder, and, which is a small town. Everybody had grown up with me. Nobody was buying it. Every episode of the show I was on had a major glitch affecting the outcome of the game. You start off by calling a phone number and playing a phone game. They give you four things to put in order. Put these steps in giving a cat a pill in order. Put these countries in order from north to south. Anything, and a zillion of these things. Your odds of getting the three questions right are 2% to 4%. They put you in a random drawing. It usually takes 30 to 40 successful tries to get a call back to play round two, which is again over the phone. You do well enough at that game they fly you to New York. So it's a long process. But you get on. Yeah. I was on the very first episode of the show. Everybody was nervous. I screw up the first fastest finger. The second fastest finger, Regis asks, put these Woody Allen movies in the order they were first released. Manhattan, Annie Hall. He gets to the third one, he says, what the heck is that? The third one is Hannah and her sisters. The letters were too crammed together for him to read it. I got it right, and I got it right fast. Now, the producers have a choice. Make a judgment call about whether or not this is a flawed fastest finger question. My bet is that they let other factors influence them. Other factors? Had a woman, for instance, won that fastest finger, odds are much higher that they would have kept that question. The first guy in the hot seat looked like a younger, cuter version of me. We're both Jewish, we both had goatees and black hair. I think there's an 85 to 90% chance I was the one who would have ended up in the seat and turn that first episode that everything's riding on into a parade of goatee boys. The producer would have had to be Mother Teresa not to take the opportunity to roll the dice again and hope that a woman makes it on the next fastest finger. So they throw it out, a woman gets in the center, which is what I think they want which is what I think they want. I had an inkling that chicks might dig scars. I had a lot of scars, all of them in bad places. Ninth grade, I start working out and give myself a hernia, get a four inch scar along my groin. A bunch of scars up and down my left leg from a varicose vein stripping that shouldn't have been done at all. 
went out for wrestling, put myself on this not very well-advised diet, lettuce and dog biscuits, because I was reading package labels and the, and the biscuits seemed to have a lot of fiber and not a lot of fat. I got very bad hemorrhoids. I'm veiny and hemorrhoids are ass veins. It's all part of the same deal. I'm walking around the school, you know, with a maxi pad in the back of my shorts and pantyhose to keep my leg from falling apart. Plus I'm on Percodan, so I don't really give a shit that I'm like farting for my destroyed rectum every time I go down the stairs. I had all these scars that had shown that I'd been through these various procedures. They only served to be kind of embarrassing. Maybe chicks would dig cool scars. Good scars in good places. I started going as Conan every Halloween. Conan's always like bleeding from a couple places from his sword encounters and stuff. So a couple of years I just I packed myself up a la Conan. Then Rambo comes out and I don't know, like 85. His scars are in almost exactly the same place as I placed mine. And they had to have like a designer scar consultant who decided that here's where they'd look the best. So I felt validated in that I had good aesthetic taste in my placement of scars. But the deal is that women do not really dig scars. And the few women who do were women that I didn't want to know. Way too scary. So that's a bad choice. I mean, I wish I were more perfectible. There was a girl went to my first high school that she was perfect, except she had a, a honkin' beezer. She had a suspicious falling off the tractor while drunk accident and came back with perfect nose and then she really, you know, she was amazing. I just wish there were just a couple things that could be messed with on me that would make me amazing. Probably in October of my first senior year in high school. I read a book called Type A Behavior and Your Heart. And at that point, I was a super high achiever. I was in all these clubs. I had really good grades, high SATs, all this stuff. Two alarm clocks, sharp stuff on the floor between the bed and the alarm clock so that I'd poke my feet and it would wake me up. And I just had a lot of stuff going on. They said that a type A person looks back on stuff that happened to him and wishes that it could be fixed or done over. As soon as I read that, I thought, that's an interesting idea, the do-over thing. It's like time travel. I broke into my high school, stole a bunch of blank transcript materials, created a new high school permanent record, gave myself a B average instead of an A average. Wait, 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 You lowered your average? I saw high school as something that could be done right. I just wanted to be a more regular kid, go back to high school in Albuquerque and have a more fun high school existence. So episode one, you get bounced out. I just didn't get in the center. You go home? Yeah. I figured having gotten on there once, there's a pretty good chance I can get back on the show. Kept calling, playing the phone game. Eventually, I made it back on. Because you were older and wiser? No obsessive practicing. Can you practice to be the fastest finger? You can. I taped a calculator to my steering wheel sideways and used the keypad 
the words on a billboard, put them in alphabetical order, numbers on a license plate in numerical order, practice, you know, a few thousand fastest fingers. I have a six-year-old daughter, Isabella. We went down to Disney World for a family vacation. I know that we're going to be spending a certain amount of time, you know, standing around or sitting around, you know, waiting for some Disney thing to happen. So I took my World Almanac, and I tore out all the pages that weren't pertinent, the zip codes of every single town above population 5,000. Don't need that. Tossed those away. Each section was about 100 pages thick, and I'd just take one section with me every time we went out into whatever land we were going. What is Isabella saying about all of this? Nothing. She knows I'm kind of, you know, always lost in my own fog. I mean, you know, what does she care what I'm reading? I wasn't the first one in the middle on that show. The guy who was got all the way up to the million dollar question. I was feeling sucky thinking, all right, here's another time that I'm not gonna make it in the center. I'll have to go back home and wait another year to try to get back in the center again. And all that wasted time. Then they came by and said, we've got time to do one more fastest finger. Going back to high school, I had to manufacture a whole new identity. I wanted to mess with my name to the point where it wouldn't pop up on a computer match and make anybody suspicious. So I turned Rick into my middle name and gave myself a first name that nobody in a million years would ever want to use, that name being Gilligan. So I became Gilligan Rick Rosner. I registered Highland High in Albuquerque, class of 79. You're applying for a second senior year or you're applying for freshman? No, why, I, there's no point in going back to high school and not being a senior. The seniors are the ones who have the fun and the power. You wouldn't want to go back and be a oppressed little freshman. Highland High was more of a goody-goody school than my former school. And I'm there trying to be a, a Barbarino with my jean jacket, with my collar up and talking, you know, dropping my G's and all that. And I'm a new kid, and I don't fit in, and people think I'm kind of thuggy. I was regarded with suspicion and distaste. I didn't have any nighttime employment skills the first time I went back to high school. I was living in this apartment without a apartment, without a phone, and if I had a dime, I'd find an empty beer bottle and go fill it with gas, and that would get me enough gas to get to the gas station to buy 50 cents more gas. I'm working in a pet store. Just cleaning up puppy crap. This was a pet store that was wall-to-wall, 
110, 120 puppies in cages stacked everywhere. Cleaning up puppy dew and stealing dog food to eat because I was starving. You're eating dog food again. Sometimes. It's a handful for the puppy and a few pieces for me. So I tried cat food, but cat food's nasty. Little bones would get caught in my throat. It's made out of some ground up something and it's, it's spiky. That was one of my jobs. I had another job where I was the only person who didn't speak Spanish at a cabinet factory. After I'd realized that nobody was going to like me anyway, I figured, all right, I'm going to actively participate in bothering you people. So I took my raw breakfast steaks with me to my first period class and just ate raw meat in, in first period chemistry. I sang the masturbation song in choir. The masturbation song? Um, last night I stay, I, last night, how's it go? Last night I stayed home and masturbated. It felt so good. I knew it would. Last night I stayed home and masturbated. It felt so nice. I did it twice. I pushed it, pulled it, rolled it on the floor, tugged it, something, slammed it in the door. Some people think that sexual intercourse is neat, but me, I beat my meat. Anyway, by November I was done with that high school. Trying it the second time, it was even worse. Yes. It was it was worse the second time. So how many times do you end up going to high school? The first time, class of 78, then I was class of 79, prom for somebody in the class of 80, was unsuccessful at schmoozing my way into the LA public schools, class of 81, impersonated somebody in the class of 84, and then my last time in high school was class of 87. High school's attractive to me not because you necessarily have a good time, but because it's clear why you are miserable. This, this, and this. As opposed to real life, post high school life, you can be miserable and not have a clear idea what makes you miserable. Dissatisfactions are more vague, more amorphous. High school is an abridged version of real life and its abridgment adds clarity, and that clarity is comforting. In the briefings I was there for, the executive producer, Michael Davies, says, don't worry about the correctness of a question. If the question is not right, we will track down the truth of the question and we will rectify it. They asked a woman, how long did it take Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel? Their answer was four years, but that's how long it took him to paint just the ceiling. He spent another six, seven, eight years painting the last judgment on one of the walls of the chapel. So his total painting time was 10 to 12 years which wasn't one of the answers. So no right answer, they had to bring her back. Congratulations, Richard. The reason he's so excited is that he was a fastest finger contestant on our very first show. And now all these months later, 123 shows later, you made it in the hot seat. Congratulations, just great. Let's play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And here it is for 100. <laughs> I answer all the easy questions. There's one question that strikes me as a little bit odd. According to a familiar expression, all good things come in what? Sevens? I'd heard good things come in small packages. I'd heard that dead celebrities come in threes or that bad things come in threes. I'd never heard good things come in threes, but that was the only answer that made sense. So I had to guess a little bit on that. Good things come in threes? You ever heard that? No. So. He's going for $16,000 right now. $16,000 questions can be answered about 70% of the time by 
an intelligent, knowledgeable person. What capital city is located at the highest altitude above sea level? I'm shocked because I've tracked the show. I've watched just about every single episode. I've recorded the hardness level at every level, just based on hundreds and thousands of questions. I spend, my wife timed it, 22 minutes in the chair. By the time you get to the seat, you're drained. It's five, six hours each way, in coach, feeling nervous because you're going to be on the show. You get there at 10 at night, just in time to try to sleep a few hours. They pick you up early. They take you to where they can watch you. They don't allow you any reading materials. We'd been quarantined at ABC since something like 7 a.m. Now it's like 5.30 at night your adrenaline's pretty much depleted. Mexico City's attractive because it's the highest mega metropolis in the world. It's so big that people don't even know how many people live there. Kathmandu's extremely attractive. Half the people I've asked who knew where all four cities were answered Kathmandu. Bogota is an attractive answer because it differs from Quito in World Almanac elevation by only about 550 feet. I read a book called Texas Celebrity Turkey Trot by the guy who wrote North Dallas 40. Everybody who was obnoxious got what they wanted. That book convinced me I wasn't nearly obnoxious enough in my behavior. I decided to start working in obnoxious fields. What would my life be like if I wasn't smart at all? How would I make a living? and I came up with stripping and bouncing. I thought bouncing might be one more way to, to meet women, acquire social skills. I've been a bouncer now for almost 21 years and I get to mess with people who wouldn't have liked me if I'd gone to high school with them. I became a stripper at the same time. I actually had to stop with my date in the car and go do a strip job on the way to prom with my date and with her corsage and sitting in the car. She was very tolerant. Maybe part of having the better high school experience is having the opportunity to be a jerk. My self-esteem was all screwed up. Not only had I not gone to Harvard, but I hadn't even done well at going back to high school the second time around. Back to high school the second time around. I returned to Boulder after a few months, wrecked, ended up registering for my hometown college, barely going to class, eating eight meals a day, trying to bulk up, stripping, bouncing. Found out that 
the IQ tests on which I'd scored 150 only went to 150. Took some more IQ tests and started scoring in the 170s, 180s, 190s. So I'm thinking, all right, that is adequate intelligence to be able to really do what I want to do. I should start acting smart. And the one thing I knew I could do, even if I couldn't successfully complete a theory of the universe, was I could absorb information. So I set a target of reading a book a day. When I got to L.A., I wanted to check out whatever library resources the area offered. I accumulated 44 library cards for different communities across the state. San Diego up to San Luis Obispo or something. One time in a library in Oceanside, California, I found a book on relativity I've never seen anywhere before. Amazing diagrams of what the rotation of axes actually would look like at various speeds close to the speed of light. In Oceanside, California, and somewhere in there I decided, all right, I'll go back to high school and just sit in a desk and think all day. I figured high school would be a good place to do that. You're staring out the window for X number of hours a day. High school is like a controlled experiment. The variables are limited. It's got a nice structure. Make discoveries. Michael Davies, executive producer. Dear Michael, as you might expect from someone who spent hundreds of hours over the course of a year studying and practicing to make it to the hot seat, I've spent the last two weeks scrutinizing every aspect of the elevation question. You must already know that the question is flawed. About 4% of the questions they ask are magnitude questions. The oldest, youngest, biggest, longest, whatever. They have two ways of asking magnitude questions. Which of these and what is the? Which of these implies you have to pick from among those four? When they say, what is the? What is the biggest state in the United States? You have to pick the very biggest from all 50 states. My question is phrased, what capital city is located at the highest altitude, the capital city at the highest altitude. The answer is La Paz, Bolivia. Unless you consider Lhasa a capital, which some people do and some people don't, because Tibet was taken over by China in the 50s. Neither of those cities were listed among the answers. According to the way the question is phrased, the correct answer is missing. Missing. Dear Mr. Rosner, after reading your letters and reviewing our research, we continue to believe that the answer to your $16,000 question is correct. Of the four capital cities given as answer choices, Quito is the highest and thus is the correct answer. Sincerely, Alexandra W. Cantalupo. This time, I forged a set of 40 separate documents that all went into my high school permanent record, which were all lost by the school district. So I made it in on the basis of four extra documents I had sitting around. And I had a lot of trouble with stubble. I shaved every day, very close, you know, two, three times, but I still had a lot of five o'clock shadow. I looked much younger in the morning after gravity had pulled my face up while I was sleeping. And then at the end of the day, I had trouble using my bus pass, and my face would have fallen. I would have aged an apparent three years or something, and I always had to like, show the rest of the fake contents of my wallet in order to use my student bus pass. And by then, I knew how to do it right. It was high school student by day, nude model, bouncer by night. I was just very tired all the time. I was going out with a big, muscly woman 
big, muscly, angry woman, very attractive, big, muscly, angry woman, who I suggested become a bouncer with me at one of the bars I was working at. She did it. She was good. And she was good at taking people down and choking them out. There was all sorts of angry, scary sex that I had a hard time getting over. Sex that's linked with fear makes an indelible impression. Sex that's linked with fear? Yeah. It somehow hardwires itself into your brain. We would have angry fights, and in the middle of the fight, I'd get a big erection because I knew that at the end of the argument, we would be having wild monkey angry sex. Anyway, she ended up finally blowing me off for yet another bouncer, this big, puffy, man-breasty bouncer. It was a horrible breakup. I was taking a long time to recover, as you might imagine. But I had specific strategies for getting over my bummedness. I had to do something goofy at least once a week. I flew a physics equation on a banner towed by an airplane over Boulder in Denver. A physics equation? Yeah. I had this formula that reflected what I thought about the structure of the universe. The way Planck's constant shrinks in proportion to the addition of mass in your locality. That was just stupid thing one that day. The stupid thing two was I went to a Jewish singles dance knowing it was going to be kind of an embarrassing and unproductive experience. I went because it was a goofy thing to do. I didn't anticipate things being so good at this Jewish singles dance in Denver, Colorado in 1986. My future wife was there being Jewish and she was wearing a big purple prom dress. Was she dressed as a high school girl? No, it was just a not quite appropriate, but still very attractive dress. And then you had a daughter? Yes. She's probably more socially adept than either of her parents. She's smart, especially visually. It's too early to say extraordinary, but she's good at stuff. She's faster at doing jigsaw puzzles than my wife. She's been faster for a couple of years. But I'm not looking for a prodigy here. What you looking for? Somebody who can live their life effectively. Dear Michael, I hope that you've had a chance to look over the letter I faxed on Friday. I'm sorry to keep sending you letters. I'm not a grievance-oriented person, but I have found overwhelming and conclusive evidence that Millionaire made devastating mistakes on this question. La Paz, Lhasa, Quito, Kathmandu, Bogota, Mexico City, none of these are flat little towns. All these are big splotches of humanity that are built way up the sides of mountains. Quito's like a city built on a crumpled piece of paper. It runs up the side of a volcano. It's up and down every place. From the lowest altitude of below 600 feet at the Gaia La Bamba River to a highest altitude of 15,696 feet at the top of the volcano Pachincha. Quito, the choice is pretty arbitrary. If you can pick any point from 600 feet to 16,000, we're talking three miles vertical range. Kathmandu is this big urban mess. It sits at the bottom of this valley, but it sits at the bottom of this valley, but it's built all the way up these mountains running up to about 9,000 feet. Mexico City covers more land than 30 of the world's nations, like 50 miles by 60 miles, volcanoes and 
goes from a low of about 7,000 feet to 12,000 feet. So all these cities have altitudes that overlap each other. But all that is secondary. They want the highest capital. The highest capital wasn't one of the choices offered. It's a bad question. There's a map book of LA called the Thomas Guide that has like 120 pages. I've kept track of how many different pages of the Thomas Guide I've been naked in. And it's something like 40. It's like I'm running my own game show, Naked Bingo, trying to get, you know, like seven consecutive squares where I've been naked. If I'm looking to complete a naked square, you know, I'll look in that square and see if there are any colleges, and then I'll go hit the art department and see if they can use a model. Is this competitive? Depends. Art Center Pasadena doesn't hire me anymore because they've caught me being an idiot too many times. Which means... All right. Well, sometimes they ask you to work in costume. They asked me to be a construction worker, which was fine. I, could, I have a bunch of tools. I brought in some tools. There's this old easel stand that's just all rotten. And I'm actually working on it, trying to knock it back together. The wood is all termite eaten and the saw slips. I saw my thumb in half. So blood's going all over the place, and I got to get off the stand and get wrapped up. Though I was accurate, because if you look at the hands of people who actually work at, as carpenters, they've all got nine and a half fingers. A little bit too authentic. If you're in a tough pose where all your muscles are clenched, pain and immobility would help me focus on thinking about the structure of the universe. Relationships between physical constants, what I call lazy voodoo physics, deciding that that's an interesting constant between the proton and the electron. Maybe the universe is that ratio times the apparent age of the universe old. So how old? Let's put an age on the universe. All right, let me take a wild guess. Let's pretend this is a very valuable question on millionaire. At least the proton-electron mass ratio times the apparent age of the universe, 30 trillion years old. It's got to be at least that old. The time it takes a person to form a thought is about 1 30th of a second two and a half million thoughts a day. All right, two and a half million times. So you're looking at 750 billion thoughts over a lifetime. Then you're looking at 15 billion times, 750 billion times, maybe 10 to the 65th. The universe is pretty old. If it's anything like what I think it is. I looked at 25,000 questions from 14 countries in seven languages, every continent except for Africa and Antarctica. Out of those 25,000 questions, I found over a thousand magnitude questions. Every correct magnitude question is phrased according to the proper rules of what is the and which of these. There are three incorrect magnitude questions that I've found. The two besides mine would be wrong regardless of how they were phrased. They asked in one of their board games what U.S. state has the longest coastline. Their answer is Michigan. World Almanac, Time Almanac, Rand McNally Atlas, 16 out of 17 different dictionaries. Coastline refers to land adjacent to a sea or ocean. It's got zero coastline. It's wrong. Now, wait a second. This is the board game? This is the chocolate board game. If you get the questions right, you're supposed to be rewarded with pieces of chocolate. So on the chocolate board game, 
they have the Michigan question. Yes. So the only magnitude question that made it to broadcast, improperly phrased, was mine. I was certainly a better daddy before my stupid millionaire thing. We'd build puzzles together and I was less distracted. What kind of puzzles? The foam core 3D puzzles. Notre Dame we built, Mont Saint-Michel, and we were working on Big Ben when the whole millionaire thing happened. And, you know, I started spending my nearly 600 hours researching the topography of all these cities. Big Ben never got close to being finished. Maybe a couple little ornaments that go along the top edge before you get to the clock. Almost none of it's finished. So my wife finally put it back in the box. Dear Alex, I'm writing again about the capital altitude question. It's been a while, not because I've given up, but because I've been working three jobs and because researching the question is like having yet another job. And I've hesitated out of reluctance to be told once again that you won't treat me with the same fairness you've extended to other contestants. They're not admitting it. It's a bad question. The odds that what Millionaire is claiming, that it was accidental that some questions were phrased, what is the, and other questions were phrased, which of these is, the odds that all that is accidental is one in about 10 to the 85th. Which is not so far away from a Google. Equal to the probability of tossing a coin and having it come up heads about 280 consecutive times. So how do you explain this phenomenon? They made a mistake. It's not accidental how their questions were phrased. With a certainty down to one part in 10 to the 85th. Obviously, I'm persistent. I have some highly developed research and persistence skills, unmatched by anybody. And it makes me sad that I have the emotional flaw that made me persist at this when a more reasonable person would have given up, chalked it up to experience, and moved on. It's just kind of weird that of all the people to get a question that would take hundreds of hours of research to demonstrate its wrongness that I would be the one to get it. Do you feel unlucky? I don't like thinking about luck. I like to think of myself as a science guy. But there's one thing with regard to luck that makes me nervous. I see many more pennies lying face down than I do face up. Beyond what you'd expect from statistical variation. There's just something weird that I can't explain. Dear Mr. Rosner, as I explained to you in my August 11th letter, we believe that the answer to your $16,000 question is correct and that, therefore, a return trip to the show is not warranted in your case. Sincerely, Alexandra W. Cantalupo. Oh, 
my God. Keto. It was Keto. Keto. Oh, rich, 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 rich. Sorry, old man. Why not give this up? Why not let this go? You're driving through the intersection on a green light. Somebody sideswipes the crap out of you. Spun your car around. Screwed up your neck. causes $32,000 damage to your car and your body. How long do you pursue it? If I'm driving in LA and, well, this happened, I was driving in LA. I had my clicker on, I was driving prudently Somebody took off the whole left rear corner of my car and kept on going. There's no fix in that. I don't know who did it. But here's a show that has people that I can write to, a reputation for doing the right thing, tells people that they are dedicated to doing the right thing. This is a rectifiable mistake. They could put you in the chair again. They should put you in the chair again. Yeah, put me in the chair again. Put me in the stinky chair, at the very least. Do-overs. Do-overs. But it's not like I engineered this situation. They're the ones who asked me the screwed up question. If I had to break it down into responsibility, I'd break it down this way. 80% their fault for giving me a horrible bad question. 5 to 10% my fault for not having absolute perfect knowledge of every fucking thing in the world almanac. I didn't get to that table. It was towards the end of one of my torn apart sections. So I didn't have perfect knowledge. And 10% my fault for not being more paranoid and suspicious about their ability to ask accurate questions. There's five days to go until graduation. I'm just lurking in the halls of the school trying to find the, the least well-lit areas of the school so I can just sit there hunched over until graduation day. So at some point it became about making it to graduation. And your relationship with the other students? It was good. It was successful. It was everything I wanted high school to be, except for the getting laid part, because I was 26. I didn't think it was ethical, and because I didn't want the extra trouble I would be in if I were caught not only being a fake high school student, but a fake high school student being intimate with a real high school student. If I had to do it all over again, I would have tried to graduate high school really early at like age 14 and then spent the next 15 years solidly going to high school all across the country. Shoot for a, going to a hundred different high schools. But I got started late. I didn't know that going to high school was a calling of mine until I was almost too old to pull it off. There's no way to time travel except in the goofy way that I did it. I sent myself back to age 18 for a year. I hope doing that might kind of prime me mentally to think about how time works. 
Some of what I think about is the retrieval of lost time. I've wasted a lot of time trying to retrieve lost time. Bogota with Quito winning out at 9,222. 